part of what we're doing. So first in your seatbelts today, and let me take you right now into a gospel adventure, into the service, where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. So first Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9, but as it is written, I had not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for those that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. What has God revealed to us by the Spirit? The deep things of God. We have access to the deep things of God revealed to us by the Spirit. The deep things of God. All right? Verse 11 of that same chapter. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received. Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of riches of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God reveals to us, and we know. The spirit that reveals the things to us is the spirit that knows. That's the spirit that knows the deep things of God, and is that spirit that reveals to us the things that we know. Remember, we were dealing with, they shall know me. From the least to the greatest in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10, 11 and 12. They shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and iniquities I will remember again no more. And we establish that this is not just personal knowledge or intimate knowledge. This is the knowledge of God in the New Testament. Knowledge as revealed by God in the New Testament. All right. And when the Spirit now reveals to them, they will know me in the epistles. We took time to establish that. Meaning that the New Testament, therefore, interprets to us the Old Testament or reveals to us the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, it's out that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. And I remember this where I began to talk about the fact that in our church world today, you know, men of God who are very lazy with Bible study, when they get to this place, they now say that there are some mysteries, mysteries that are revealed to men of God, like mystery of papa, mystery of coconut, mystery of sand from the village, mystery of koboko, they call it mystery. But when the scripture was talking about mystery here, he wasn't talking about any of those things that they do in the name of mysteries. He says, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words. This mystery is not purple. This mystery is something that you're going to read. This mystery is not water to wash your legs. This mystery is not something they call blood of sprinkling or rabina in water that you keep pouring on yourself. This mystery is something you read whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This mystery is knowledge. You may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So there is a knowledge given to brother Paul in the mystery, which is the Old Testament concerning Christ. Knowledge given to brother Paul in the mystery, which is the Old Testament concerning Christ. This knowledge is revelation by the Holy Ghost. It is this knowledge that has been collected together as the epistles for us to read. Whereby when you read, it's not some water to wash your leg. It's not some um, perfume to put on your body to, for God to change your smell. If you're smelling, go and bath. If you're still smelling, see a doctor. You may have some skin stuff that require medical attention. God doesn't have time to be changing people's smells. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. These holy apostles and prophets, like we said, are the apostles and prophets that put together the canon of scripture. Foundational apostles. Next verse. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That I should preach the unsearchable riches of Christ among the Gentiles. 
whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge. So, Paul said, I have revelation knowledge of this mystery. Colossians 1.25 Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generation but now is made manifest to his saints. What is this mystery that has been hid? Is it purple? Is it coconut? Is it washing your leg? To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. So what is this mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is not a cloth called mantu. The mystery is not any of those. The mystery is the revelation of Christ in the born again man. Which is the confident expectation of glory. So what was a mystery in the Old Testament is now revealed in the epistles. The epistles therefore are the revelation of the Holy Scriptures. So when you say something reveals, it means it will use words to define concepts. When we say something has been revealed, it means words have been used to define concepts. The words in the new covenant are explanatory. The words in the new covenant are explanatory. They are the language of the spirit. The words in the new testament are explanatory. They are the language of the spirit. For example, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in this last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. His son, he has spoken to us in his son, by whom he made the world. Watch verse 3. Who will be in the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, that is the Jesus, the writer of Hebrews wants you to see the Jesus that has conquered death, has risen, and is seated at the right hand of majesty because the job has been done. So when he says his son, he is saying that in his son, in Christ, we have the flawless revelation of God. Express image. The son is the express image of God. The son gives to us a revelation of God outside of shadows and doubts. The Son reveals the Father to us expressly. Direct revelation of God. Jesus is the direct revelation of God. So I cannot know God by reading the Old Testament only. I will know God by reading the epistles which are the revelations of the Old Testament. Look at Job chapter 1 verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. When we begin to explain what the word sons of God there is, you will discover that the sons of God are not like the children of God. The sons of God there means Satan also presented himself in a meeting of angels. In the Old Testament, angels were called sons of God. In the Old Testament, Angels were referred to as sons of God. Look at another one. Job 38, 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That's the same thing Daniel saw in Daniel 3, 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no heart. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. He didn't say the fourth one is the son of God. The form, the form of the fourth is like metaphor. Metaphor. What he was simply saying is that he saw an angel that he called him son of God. Doesn't mean son of God like children of God. What he's dealing with here is angels. Several times you will see men of the Old Testament calling angels my Lord. My Lord. They call angels my Lord. For example, the angel that came to Sarah and Abraham. 
he called that angel my lord if you remember that day when abraham was sitting in front of the house under the heat of the sun by the tent and three men walked to him and he stood up and worshiped and called them my lord those were angels those were angels so several times in the old testament they call angels my lord or they call angels sons of god now look at hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 hath in this last day spoken unto us by his son whom he had appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels why did the writer of hebrews why did he have to bring angels into this comparison again remember the book of hebrews is a book of comparison he begins with angels and the son he entered prophets have in this last day spoken to us by the son angels son aaron jesus joshua couldn't take them into the rest but he took them into the promised land but jesus takes us into the rest so joshua jesus then he deals with the levitical priesthood and he deals with jesus's priesthood the entire book is a book of comparison so why did the writer of hebrews begin with angels because of the way the old testament people saw angels as sons so the writer of hebrews now tells them no 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 angels are not sons of god jesus is a son he's fixing things together here for this jewish audience remember the book of hebrews was addressed to the jewish audience can i hear a good amen verse 5 for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son so it wasn't god that called them sons in the old testament it was men who didn't have understanding who saw beings that they could not comprehend and the only way they could describe them were sons of God. But now the writer of Hebrews says, which of the angels had God ever, ever, at any time, meaning from when time began, to which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Meaning, nobody can be a son until you give birth to the person. God never gave birth to any angel. Angels were not birthed by God. Angels were created. There's a difference between creation and birth. God is the creator of everybody. But God is not the father of everybody. For God to father you, he must give birth to you. That is why when you receive Christ, it is called new birth. So angels were created by God. They are not sons. For you to be a son of God, God must give birth. You must come out of God. You and God must share the same DNA. In James 1, 18, it says, Of his own will, begat he us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creation. So to which of the angels say they are any time? You are my son. So people spoke in the Old Testament based on their limits. He said, at any time. Which of the angels has God ever called a son? At any time. So they didn't know the son of God in the Old Testament. So anything that looked out of the ordinary, they referred to it as son of God. Are you still here? Just look at the word Lord in Hebrews 1.13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until i make thy enemies thy foot still what he's saying is which of the angels did god say you are a lord which of the angels did god ask to sit because the only person that will sit will be the lord no angel but old testament people call them lord and old testament people call them sons but today we know who the son is and today we know who the lord is and today we know who the angels are. Are these not all ministering servants? But to which of the angels say they at any time sit on my right hand until I make their enemies their footstool? Are they not all, all of them, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be inheritors of salvation? Angels have no authority whatsoever. 
When Jesus showed up, revelation showed up. Today we have the express flawless revelation of God. We know all things. We are not in darkness. They that are in darkness, the day shall overtake them as a thief. But we are not in darkness. We are in the light. We are of the day. That means when the rapture will happen, we will know exactly when the rapture will happen. In the book of Thessalonians. Why? We know all things. That's why it's called epignosis. You know epignosis at all? Epignosis means nothing is hidden any longer. It's called comprehensive insight. You know meaning of comprehensive? Compre it's not partial. We have comprehensive insight. It means accurate, exact, precise knowledge. Epignosis. If there are things we don't know, then we don't have epignosis. You can't know some things and then some you don't know, then you call it epignosis. No. Epignosis means accurate, comprehensive insight. And that's why brother Paul prayed and he said to Philemon that the communication of your faith may be effectual. Every good thing, including knowing when the rapture will happen. We are not of the night. We are of the day. And that day shall not overtake us as a thief in the night. Come on, shout, I'm not of the night. Say it very loud, I'm not of the night. I am of the day. And say with me, I will know exactly the day and the hour when the trumpet will sound. Because I'm already ready. Even now. I didn't hear your amen. We are not of the night. We are of the day. So that day shall not overtake us as a thief in the night. We have accurate knowledge. We know all things. What man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of a man that is in him. So likewise, the things of God knoweth no man. Save the spirit of God. Now, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God that knows all things, that we may receive the things that are freely given to us of God. We have epignosis. If there's anything you don't know, it's because you have not studied. If there's anything you don't know, it's because you've not been taught. Everything about God has been revealed in Christ and made expressly clear to our understanding by the Spirit of God that is in God that searches the deep things of God and unveils the hidden things of God. That's why there's no more mystery where we are concerned. Every mystery is demystified in Christ. Zapata. When you come to Christ, you come to the unveiling of the totality of every mystery about God. God is no more mysterious. He was mysterious to them, but to us, he is unveiled. So we see God clearly. We are no more looking through a glass. We are seeing God clearly. As revealed in Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. Whereof we speak. Angels have no authority. He has not put the world in subjection to angels. They don't have authority. Let's do a little further study to know who the sons are. Now, God, please pay attention. God defines the son by the incarnation. And he defines son by resurrection. Until there is incarnation, there can be no son of God. And until there is resurrection, there can be no sons of God. It's the incarnation that God used in defining sonship. Not some invisible or some winged beings. Winged beings that fly around or that appeared and disappeared. That doesn't make them sons. A son is defined by the incarnation and sons are defined by the resurrection so until incarnation there was no son and until there was resurrection there were no sons anything else called sons was a wrong label on a wrong article due to the limitation of the men that were in operation remember eyes have not seen ears have not heard but now they are revealed to us. So they never saw, we see. So through the glass of Christ, we can see the limitation of the Old Testament. 
we can see their limitation through the binoculars of Christ. So the Old Testament defines sons by appearance of glory and lordship. That's how they define sons. Once something appears out of the ordinary, they call it son. By the appearance of glory and lordship. God defines sonship by incarnation and resurrection. So it's in the incarnation that we know is the son of God. When the word became flesh, the son showed up. He's called the only begotten son. The only, meaning nobody else is a son. Nobody was called a son where God is concerned until incarnation. It was the appearance of God in human flesh that is called the son of God. The monogenua, the Greek word. When he died and rose, he lost the title of the only begotten son. At his resurrection, he became the first begotten, the prototokos. The first begotten from the dead. He became the model son of all sons. And because he died and lost the title, the only begotten son, in dying, he died as the corn of wheat. And when the corn of wheat dies, it brings forth fruit. So Jesus became the first fruit. In the New Testament, first fruit is Jesus. It's not money. Jesus is the first fruit of all the sons. The first fruit of all the sons. He became the first fruit of all the sons. So, through his resurrection, when you receive Christ, you now become a son. Until incarnation, nobody was a son of God. In one genealogy, I think it was the genealogy of Luke or Matthew, they call Adam the son of God. That word son for Adam there is not a properly translated word. It shouldn't have been son of God. It should have actually been Adam created by God. Not son. Creation. Because God created Adam and formed Adam. Adam was not butted. Adam was formed from the dust. You are butted. You are born of God. Whatsoever is born of God, God gave birth to you. That's why you and God share the same DNA. Zabadaga. What cannot fight him cannot fight you. Zimboda Kodakataya. Nobody could be called a son until the incarnation. So anywhere you see son in the Old Testament, it requires interpretation. Because nobody was a son until Christ came. He's the first to be called son. That's why it's called the only, the only begotten son. Now, I want to do some little work here quickly. You must pay attention, therefore, to the language of the new covenant. Because the language of the new covenant is different from the language of the old covenant. John 10, 34. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I say, ye are gods. When we go to the original text where Jesus quoted this from, you will find out that Jesus didn't quote everything. He didn't quote everything that was in the original scripture. He just picked a sentence. Alright? Ye are gods. Why? Because the law... The law is not the revelation of God. Remember, the law is not of faith. The law is not a revelation of God. So, when you find the word gods, gods used in the epistles, it is a very miserable usage of the word. For example, the word gods in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, so the epistles already place a disclaimer on the usage of the word gods for believers. We are not gods. In the Old Testament, they use that term. 
But New Testament vocabulary is different from Old Testament vocabulary. That's why again you must pay attention to the usage of words. Because if you observe carefully, Jesus didn't quote the whole verse. He didn't quote the whole sentence. He just picked something. So the word God is used by the Holy Spirit to refer to idols. The New Testament is revealed by the Holy Spirit. You know, he has given us his spirit that we may know the deep things of God. So the New Testament is the language of the Holy Ghost for the believer. And we stay with the language of the Holy Ghost because it is the language of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament that unveils the level of illiteracy in the Old Testament. See? Very important. That's why you must pay attention to language. That's why you must listen to words very carefully. Don't assume you heard something. Make sure you heard it. You didn't hear what I said. Don't assume you heard something. And don't take what I said and add your own to it. You can use your own to neutralize what I said or to contradict what I said. So take what I said the way I said it and understand it. Don't quote me out of context. It's like a young man came to this church, got excited, had me teaching and I said, the Bible is not the word of God. And he took that and ran away. He didn't even wait for me to finish my statement. He went out and started saying the Bible is not the word of God. And people began to abuse him. Insulted him and he got angry that they are abusing him. I said to him, if I'm the one, I will slap you. Because I didn't say the Bible is not the word of God. That's not what I said. What I said is and was and will be. I will not change it. Because I know exactly what I said. What I said is that the Bible is not the word of God. Because the word of God is not paper and ink. Okay, the Bible is not the word of God because the word of, if you want to quote it, then wait, follow me and carry the whole thing. And this is how to carry the whole thing. The Bible is not the word of God because the word of God is not paper and ink. John 1 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The same, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, not it by him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness and the darkness cannot handle it verse 6 there was a man sent from god whose name was john verse 11 he came unto his own and his own received him not verse 12 but as many as received him to them gave him power to become the sons of god which were born not of blood nor of flesh nor of the will of man but of god and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the begotten of the father full of grace and truth and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace so if you want to say that statement you must say everything i have said from when i said it to where i stop otherwise don't say it these things are coming out of depths of meditation careful thoughts and construction of the language of the spirit giving it natural concept for human understanding so because they are weighty you must be patient and studious to understand the entire statement before you go out to say it don't just take a sentence and go out you make yourself vulnerable to attack bible say you must have a reason for your faith meaning you must be able to defend your faith so it's not just uh, any, uh, uh, uh. wait listen carefully if you are making notes make it well I said the son is known in the incarnation okay if you stop there you are going to mess up if you stop at that you will misbehave after this service because that is not where I stopped the statement that is where I started the statement but that is when you hear people like Peter are saying that the things brother Paul is teaching are too hard. Old apostles like Peter are bowing. Then you think you can casually just carry it? <laughs> I didn't say that the New Testament or God defines sonship in the incarnation only. That's where I started. Then I concluded. And in the resurrection, sons, in the incarnation, son. In the resurrection, sons. That now 
reveals Christ the Son and the believer in him as sons. That is what makes it a complete sentence. Please pay attention. It's very important. Because if you don't, you, you will keep hearing this message for 10 years and not understand it. It's work. It's labor. My attention was called to somebody who was just talking carelessly on Facebook during my broadcast. Just carelessly. Because we were teaching about, you know, um, the book of Ephesians. And we made statements like, a believer gets born again, he has the spirit of God. And a believer that is born of God cannot backslide. You have the spirit of God, where are you backsliding to? You can backslide. And they said the person wrote there, I disagree with this point. Then somebody said, why don't you wait? Why are you disagreeing in a hurry? Then the person said, I've been following this teaching for four months now. <laughs> then the person said, let us be checking everything. Let us be checking everything. The person didn't stop there. Then the person said, a believer that sins has been given up to a reprobate mind. The person doesn't even know the meaning of reprobate. You can see limitation in English. How can you come to our class and be talking carelessly? You think you're the only one that is smart. You don't know that there are people that are smarter than you and everybody is quiet. The you that don't know anything. Da, 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 da. People that are reprobate are people that do not retain God in their hearts. These people are not born again. A person that is reprobate is a person that doesn't have God. It's an unbeliever. He said because they did not retain God. God gave them up. God cannot give up. You Can you give up your children? Leave that in. Don't be sharping mouth when you don't know. Keep quiet. If you are quiet, you will have dignity. Even if you are an illiterate and you are quiet, it is called self-respect. <laughs> and when you respect yourself, people will respect you. When you talk too much, you expose yourself. You show people what a small person you are. Don't you know that when people are quiet, they make people fear them? Quiet people. Because you don't know where they are going to come out from. When somebody, ya, 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 ya. You have seen the person inside and outside. There is wisdom in silence. Bible says only a fool uttered out his heart. He said, a man that talks too much. Bible says he's a fool. Oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe. Wise people don't talk too much. They keep quiet. They take notes. They study the notes. They study the notes. In the course of study, some question you will ask and people laugh at you. You will answer it as you study. You know, there are some questions that are stupid. Bible calls it foolish questions. What did the Bible call it? foolish questions and he said what do you do to them avoid them that is attempting to answer a foolish question makes you foolish yes, sir. you didn't hear that any attempt to answer a foolish question makes you foolish a believer cannot blaspheme against the holy ghost blasphemy against the holy ghost is rejecting christ the rejection of christ is blasphemy against the holy ghost and that is the sin that will not be forgiven Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is unbelief in the gospel. A believer is not an unbeliever. He has believed the gospel. So he cannot blaspheme Holy Ghost. A believer has Christ in him. He cannot have a reprobate mind. Uh -uh. Is it not God working in you? Who is working in you? Does God fail? So that's why you must listen carefully to the things we teach. Even if they sound alike, they are not the same. There are some statements that sound alike, but they are not the same. Because every statement has its interpretation within the context in which it is said. I can say the same thing five times in five different contexts. And this same thing that I repeated five times means five different things depending on the context in which I said it. So don't assume you know something. Till you know it. Context is king in Bible study. That's why your entire lifetime, you cannot exhaust the Bible. It's too much for a lifetime. 
66 books only, but too much for a lifetime. Because in each statement, there are adjoining statements connected to that statement. You won't fail. If your amen is louder, I say you will not fail. So we're dealing with gods. I have said ye are gods. And we've seen that in the New Testament, believers are not called gods. So when Jesus said, ye are gods, where did he get it from? Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye gods. That are is not there. It was added by translators. I have said, ye gods, and all of you, children of the Most High. That's a full statement. I have said, ye gods, and all of you, children of the Most High. When Jesus quoted, he only took ye gods and left children of the most high. Because first of all, you can't even be talking of children in the Old Testament. You can't even be talking of children. Jesus decided, okay, let's stay with ye gods. Because at least we can explain ye gods. In the New Testament, you are not a god. You are not say, see, I am a god. I am a god. See, I am a god. You are not a god. You are a new creation. You are a son of God. Glory to God. Jesus wasn't prophesying. He was talking of something already existing. Something already existing. So for proper understanding, let's read the entire chapter. Psalm 82 from verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Seller. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Read them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye gods, and all of you children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. That scripture was referring to judges in Israel. Judges. You know judges? Judges that sit in the court of law over the citizenry. He was referring to judges. And in Bible days, judges were called gods. Like today in the court of law, what do we call judges? My Lord. In Bible days, they were called gods. So God was speaking to the judges of the land that they are not defending the poor. And what is the purpose for the court of law and justice? It is to defend people and make sure people's rights are given to them. But the judges were failing their responsibility over the land. He wasn't referring to children of God here. Yeah? He was referring to judges. Now, how many of you know when Satan spoke to Eve in Genesis? He said to her, God is wise. He knows the day you eat of this tree, you shall be as wise as God. That word, as wise as God, to know. The word know there is to judge. To judge, to know, to judge between good and evil. To know, to judge between good and evil. You will be like God. So in the Old Testament, God was used for judges. Let's see some few examples here. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1. It was also used for other human beings. The word God. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. A God to Pharaoh. I have made you a judge to Pharaoh. And Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. Exodus 4 16. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And that shall be to him instead of God. Exodus 21, 6. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through it and all. And he shall serve him forever. Talking about slaves here. He's talking about judges. Look at Exodus 22, verse 8. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges. Whether he have put his son unto his neighbor's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, for any manner of lusting, which another challenged to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, 
he shall pay double unto his neighbor look at verse 28 thou shall not revile the gods nor cause the ruler of the people so the gods are the rulers of the people so when he said you gods he was saying you judges you rulers he wasn't referring to children of god he wasn't referring to us we are not gods we are sons glory to god i said glory to god if it's getting clear can i hear a powerful amen somebody turn to your neighbor say i'm not a god i'm a son say it again i'm not a god i'm a son some people say you know god is the big god we are the little gods and eh -eh, nothing like that nothing like that you can't prove it in the bible so you're just creating a theory that is unfounded there's nothing like small god and nothing like big god god there's only but one god only one god amen so jesus never quoted that statement he left that children of god out Luke 4 17 to 19 and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written the spirit of the lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the lord and he closed the book he omitted something in the prophecy of isaiah when he quoted he says the day of vengeance of our god when jesus took that prophecy he omitted vengeance there are things jesus did not quote when he takes a verse from prophecy he left some things when you see such study and find out why so why didn't jesus add the day of vengeance because today is not the day of vengeance anybody praying prayers of vengeance is cooperating with satan in stealing and killing and destroying that's why jesus omitted vengeance because today is not the day of vengeance and all over the country you see everywhere day of vengeance vengeance oil vengeance bottle avenge me vengeance all over the place and it is just anger and bitterness and revenge finding expression vengeance vengeance from where today is not a day of vengeance you can't have vengeance in the day of jesus you can't have vengeance in the day of jesus why second corinthians 6 2 for he saith, i have had thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation have i succored thee behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation you can't have vengeance in the day of salvation today is the accepted time today is the day of salvation there's no vengeance so always watch what jesus didn't say because the language of the new testament is different from the language of the old testament why the language of the new testament is accurate knowledge is revealed knowledge the language of the new testament is the express revelation of god express revelation is the express revelation of god in the new testament no cause only blessing no cause only blessing in the new testament no cause only blessing in the old testament there was a combination of cause and blessing because their minds were mentally agitated about the nature of god but jesus came as the express revelation of god and he didn't judge anybody while he walked the face of the earth he didn't judge anybody even when they brought a woman in adultery that was caught in the very act he should have sentenced her neither do i condemn you because i am not here to condemn this is not the day of vengeance for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life he that believeth not is condemned already he said for the, the son of man is not come to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved so he didn't come to condemn but you can condemn yourself by rejecting what he offers it's you that condemns yourself and even then the condemnation is not enforced because even when you reject the gospel there is still opportunity for you to change your mind and accept the gospel so the condemnation is not final condemnation you can still get saved the real condemnation is when the day of salvation is closed when that day is closed, 
and you rejected Christ, then you face condemnation full time. And there are two things that close the day of salvation. Stand up, let's close. You want to hear the two things, right? Stand on your feet, let's close. <laughs> there are two things, two things that close the day of salvation. Only two of them. Number one, if you didn't accept Christ and you die, dying without Christ, you close the door of salvation. Number two, when the trumpet sounds and you don't have Christ, those are the two things, two events that can deny a man's salvation. Number one, death before he accepts Christ. Number two, the trumpet sounds and you have not believed the gospel. Otherwise, it's for everybody. That's why people that even say, God, you're very stupid. You are idiot. Have you seen people that abuse God looking healthy? Their businesses are doing well. God is not suffering from inferiority complex. People that react when you insult them are people that have some little complex. People that are very confident in themselves. When you insult them, they laugh at you. Because you are the one that look like the insult. Because if you really know who you are, you will not insult somebody. So when you insult somebody, when you give somebody a big insult, he looks at you and just, he smiles and walks away. Like you call me monkey. Am I monkey? Why should I be angry? I'm not a monkey. Even if you call me monkey for one year, I can never be a monkey. You know that thing that makes monkey monkeys is not in me. It's like somebody say you are a cow. Are you a cow? No. You're not a cow. So why is he annoying you? <laughs> What's your problem? You have problem already. So because you already have a personal problem, when they just touched it, the problem manifested. So condemnation is given to anyone who doesn't receive the gospel. Anyone who doesn't believe the gospel. When he dies or the trumpet sounds. Otherwise, that person still have chances. God is not intimidated. That's why people tell him, there is no God. I prophesy over this house, the revelation of Jesus grows big on your inside. The revelation of Christ continues to grow on your inside. Receive revelation. Receive light. Receive insight. I command the epignosis of Christ to grow on your inside. Accurate knowledge. Exact knowledge. Comprehensive insight. You will never be confused in this life. Your revelation of God will cause your relationship to get stronger. It will get stronger. It will get stronger. It will get stronger. It will get stronger. Will get stronger. You will brighten the corner where you are. I decree your lighthouses. Wherever you are found, it will illuminate your world. In the name of Jesus, barriers are broken. Obstacles are broken. You are blessed. You cannot be cursed. You are blessed. You cannot be cursed. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus, I decree, enjoy the blessings. Enjoy the grace of God. Enjoy the grace of God. Enjoy the abundance of grace. Enjoy the favor of Christ. It is well with you. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer in this building that is blessed, let your amen come from a blessing house. Oh my goodness, what a service, what a word. So mightily grew the word in Ephesus and prevailed in your life. The word is growing and it will prevail in Jesus' name. Please don't go away. This is very important.